Good evening, my fellow citizens. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. Thus, the Cuban Missile Crisis began, which led the world to the brink of nuclear destruction. Yet the crisis did not solely begin with Kennedy's speech. The true roots of the crisis go back to 1959, when Fidel Castro led a revolt in Cuba and overthrew the dictator Fulgencio Bautista. Bautista was an American-aligned dictator, so his overthrow angered the Americans. Castro soon began forming ties with the Soviet Union and signed a variety of pacts with Nikita Khrushchev, allowing Cuba to receive aid from the Soviet Union. The United States eventually led a secret operation headed by the CIA to sabotage Cuba called the Bay of Pigs, which ultimately failed, yet persistently carried out throughout the crisis. In CIA Director John A. McCone's meeting with Attorney General Robert Kennedy during January 19, 1962, the Bay of Pigs operation was outlined. With these factors in mind, the Attorney General had a discussion at the White House during the autumn of 1961 with the President, the Secretary of Defense, and General Lansdale. The Secretary of Defense assigned General Lansdale to survey the Cuban problem, and he, Lansdale, reported to the President, the Secretary of Defense, and the Attorney General in late November, concluding, one, the overthrow of Castro regime was possible, two, sugar crops should be attacked at once, and three, action to be taken to keep Castro so busy with internal problems, economic, political, and social, that Castro would have no time for meddling abroad, especially in Latin America. However, what the United States did not know was that in secret, nuclear missiles were being shipped to Cuban dictator Fidel Castro. But what the Cubans and the Russians were unaware of was that the Americans were flying U-2 spy planes on reconnaissance missions over Cuba. At first, not much was found, but on October 16, 1962, Arthur Lundahal, the CIA's chief photo interpreter, discovered medium ballistic-range missile launch sites in Cuba. From that point on in the crisis, multiple missile sites, equipment, bunkers, and other weapons of mass destruction were found by U-2 planes all over Cuba. The scariest part about this to the U.S. was that these missiles had ranges capable of striking Washington, D.C. and other major cities. After the discovery of missiles in Cuba, JFK quickly put together the XCOM team to help make decisions. This team comprised of Lyndon B. Johnson, Dean Russ, Robert McNamara, RFK, John McCone, and General Maxwell D. Taylor. Although many of Kennedy's advisors urged Kennedy to invade Cuba or bomb the missile sites, Kennedy refused. He realized that an invasion of Cuba could only lead to World War III, and while he may have known the location of some of the missile sites, he did not know where all of them were, and more missiles were still incoming to Cuba. Therefore, bombing the sites they knew of would have been a risky course of action. All ships of any kind bound to Cuba from whatever nation or port, will if found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons be turned back. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States. Instead, Kennedy decided to stop the incoming flow of weapons to Cuba by setting up a quarantine of the island. This way, the Soviets in Cuba could not gain any more missiles, and if any ship attempted to get past the blockade, they would be responsible for the consequences.
Kennedy assigned Admiral George W. Anderson as Chief of Naval Operations and came to rely on him during this time period. Meanwhile, in Russia, Premier Khrushchev was in an awful fix. The Americans had discovered his missiles before he had transported them all to Cuba. This interfered with his plan, which was to fly to Havana after all the missiles were transported, meet with Castro, and sign a social defense agreement sealed by the deployment of Soviet missiles targeting the U.S. To Khrushchev, an invasion seemed inevitable. Little did he know, the United States was strongly considering an invasion of Cuba at the time. Khrushchev's best and only method of survival during this time period was to intimidate Kennedy. In a conversation between Nikita Khrushchev and his son, Sergei, Sergei asked, How can you say that when we only have two or three? Two or three meaning nuclear missiles. Khrushchev replied, The important thing is to make the Americans believe that. That way, we prevent an attack. Khrushchev had also attempted to intimidate the United States before the crisis through public displays, such as landing the first aircraft on the moon and testing the most powerful nuclear weapons before the United States. Despite his loyalty and trust of Khrushchev, Castro was not as confident and feared an invasion much more than Khrushchev did. He constantly urged Khrushchev to nuke the United States before they made the first move. On October 25, 1962, Khrushchev was forced to pull back his ships heading towards Cuba with offensive military weapons, seeing as the United States was not backing down with the quarantine. The Soviets had blinked first. On October 26, secret negotiations between the United States and the Soviet Union began in the form of letters between Khrushchev and Kennedy. In these letters, Khrushchev explained the Soviet Union's fear of the Jupiter missiles the U.S. had in Turkey at the time. However, Castro was unaware of the negotiations between the United States and the Soviet Union and assumed the United States would still invade. He therefore ordered all his anti-aircraft sites to fire upon any American planes. As a result, a U-2 plane was shot down over Cuba. Fortunately, Kennedy issued a statement that America would only retaliate if another plane was shot. After much debate, America finally decided to remove its missiles from Turkey. As a result, the Soviets broadcasted this message back to the Americans. This is Radio Moscow. Premier Khrushchev has sent a message to President Kennedy today. The Soviet government has ordered the dismantling of weapons in Cuba, as well as their quitting and return to the Soviet Union. Although the Cuban Missile Crisis officially ended with the removal of missiles from Cuba, it continued to have a lasting effect on our world. The Cuban Missile Crisis had a close to catastrophic reaction in which indirectly called for a reform around the world that will eventually only lead to more violence. The Cuban Missile Crisis is a model of the, for the world of how international conflicts in which negotiation is called for are to transpire in a peaceful way. The United States and Soviet Russia learned firsthand the risk of possessing nuclear weapons, yet the Cuban Missile Crisis only instigated a defense mechanism in countries around the world without nuclear weapons. Countries like India and Pakistan looked upon the Cuban Missile Crisis as a reason to obtain nuclear weapons in order to defend themselves. This reform will inevitably lead to more conflict as it is only a matter of time before small organizations like terrorist organizations gain and use these weapons without having to worry about mutually assured destruction. In conclusion, the Cuban Missile Crisis has reformed the world so that massive wars between major countries are less abundant, but with the increasing number of nuclear weapons in the world as a result of the Cuban Missile Crisis, massive conflict could ensue at any time.